Bappity 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 Welcome back to the Agostino Zynga Show with me, your host, Agostino Zynga. This is episode number 336. I'm going to say that again. Tres, tres, seis. Hopefully. Hopefully. Hopefully, I pray to the gods it is. But regardless of the episode number, it's me, it's your boy, it's your host, it's your um, confidant, it's your brother you never knew you had, it's your lover you wish you never had, it's a friend you don't need, it's the colleague that you despise. <laughs> it's that guy you see on the way to work, you think, fuck, he's wearing that jacket again? <laughs> it's me, Agostino Zinger. Hope you're doing well, hope you're doing fine. Good, amazing, great. How am I? Ooh, cracking, man. I've started reading, I started reading the Daily Stoic again, right? A, a, an amazing um, book about, was it? Meditations on Wisdom, um, Perseverance and the Art of Living, right? So I'm definitely cracking. I need to read the Daily Stoic. I picked it up again. I'm like, you know what? I need a little bit of, um, I need to be centered. I need some um, stoic relief. Um, I need some philosophical help, some actionable philosophic help, some actionable steps that I can take in order to make sure that I don't succumb to the madness that is coronavirus lockdown. I'm going insane. And I'm sure everyone else is too. But you know what? I'm going insane at? I'm going insane because it appears like half of the... It's really interesting. It's like, it, maybe it's a political thing. It seems like half of the population, regardless of what country you're in, right? Whether you're somewhere in England, somewhere in the Balkans, somewhere in North America, Central America, South America, the Asian Pacific, wherever you may be, half of your um, fellow citizens or half of your fellow compatriots are under the assumption that this thing is all a fake, right? They don't believe coronavirus. They don't believe in the severity of it. They think it's all some sort of government ruse in order to get us under a governmental um, what, supervision or uh, whatever, surveillance or something, right? They don't think it's real. Half of our population, half of our citizens don't think it's real. And the other half are scared to walk outside their own home, even to go buy some sourdough bread at their local supermarket. That's not me, somebody else, right? That's what's going on here. So the ones that are, you know, are completely oblivious. And then there's also a small percentage of people. Let's say 40. Yeah, there's probably a small percentage of people, right? Who are just completely oblivious and just going on about their regular everyday life. But that's the kind of person that would walk across a road, a busy road and look get hit by a car, right? They just have the, the luck of the Irish kind of stapled on them. And those people are making me go insane because I think to myself, hold on, are we not seeing the same things? Do we not have access to the same sort of information? I do my very best to follow loads of different people, especially on Twitter, right? Because that's where most of the kind of um, uh, at for on the minute kind of news kind of spreads, right? I try and follow a lot of conservative voices. And I also try and follow a lot of liberal voices um, or left-leaning voices just so I can get a fair representation of what's going on. And then, of course, I make sure to always click the links on the articles. Never just take, whenever you see an article online, by the way, don't just take the headline or the byline of it and think that's the truth because most of the time they do a little bit of clickbait which I've kind of been you know guilty of doing in the past you do a bit of clickbait so you get people to kind of click your news article then you're hoping that the clickbait is going to pull them in and you're going to provide you're going to over deliver on the content right um, but in the news they tend to kind of uh, the titles of the articles tend to be heavily influenced um, according to the political leanings of whatever site is posting it so if it's a right leaning website it will obviously um, make sure it frames it in a conservative way. Left wing also f can try and you know frame it in a liberal way. You know, by the by. But it makes you wonder exactly what's going on. You can't really get to the truth of it. But usually, if you read both articles or you read one, <coughs> you can usually pass between it and kind of read between lines and see exactly what's going on. So those people are driving me nuts. The people that just don't think it's a thing. They're driving me insane because I'm thinking to myself, okay, let's let's imagine it's not real. Let's imagine it's all fake and it's all a ruse. No problem. If you want to go back outside, don't you think it's going to be beneficial if you just to like believe it's real just for a little bit, just so things can get back to normal? You'd think that, right? But no, they persist in just you know defying all scientific logic and still surviving. That's the that's a credit to those people though, because I love to be that oblivious. I love to be just you know um, gleefully unaware of what's going on in the world and just live my life. And then this thing just washes over, as Trump says, right? It's going to wash over. It's going to go. I hope. I love when he says that, right? He says it's going to disappear. I hope at the end, like just to kind of, it's sort of like his version of uh, like saying alleged. So he doesn't, <laughs> doesn't get some trouble and he's got like a, a backup. He's got like a, a Trump card, yeah? No pun intended. He can pull out when somebody um, rightfully kind of pulls him up on it. Like saying, how can you just say, how can you resort to hope, Mr. President? He'd be like, well, hope is the only thing that we have left in this country. And then, you know. What can you do? Anyway, so I've been reading the Daily Stoic to kind of get me centered, right? And today's 
uh, little because it's, it's broken up into days, little quotes um, taken from Stoic philosophers, and then um, an explanation in kind of plain English from the author Ryan Holiday. So for July third, this is the following. It says, uh, "Turn have uh, turn have into get to right. Turn have to it turn have to into get to." Sorry, my reading today is mad. So it says the following: the task of a philosopher. We should bring our will into harmony with whatever happens so that nothing happens against our will and nothing that we wish for fails to happen. This is from Epictetus. Let me say that again. The task of a philosopher, we should bring our will into harmony with whatever happens so that nothing happens against our will and nothing that we wish for fails to happen. Explanation from our holidays is the following. A long to-do list seems intimidated and burdensome. And burdensome. All these things we have to do in the course of a day or a week. But a get-to-do list uh, sounds like a privilege. All the things we're excited about, opportunity to experience. This isn't just um, semantic playing. It's a contractual facet of the philosopher's worldview. Today, don't try to impose your will on the world. Instead, see yourself as a fortunate to receive and respond to the will in the world. Stuck in traffic? A few wonderful minutes to relax and sit. Your car broke down after idling for so long? Ah, what a nice nudge to take a long walk the rest of the way. A swerving car driven by a distracted cell phone wielding idiot uh, nearly um, hit you as you were walking and soaked your head down to the muddy water. What a reminder that how precarious our experience, sorry, our existence is and how silly it is to get upset about something as trivial as being late or having trouble with your um, commute. Kidding aside, it might not seem like... Um, it might not seem like it makes a big difference to see life as something you have to do versus get to do, but it is a huge, magnificent difference. Now, this obviously got me thinking about what I want to do post-coronavirus lockdown and some changes I want to make in my life and stuff. And I think that's probably the 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 kind of, um, that's where I've kind of been at for the most part of coronavirus lockdown. I can't really focus on um, plans. I can't really focus on a task that I want to do during the lockdown, right? Oh, I want to do this, I want to do that, I want this, I want to do that. Because, you know, time is just a contract. Time isn't reality. It's just hard to kind of get, you know, all the days are blurring into each other and all that stuff. So I'm thinking to myself, what are the things I want to do once it's over? Obviously, driving license. Obviously, um, move out of London and head over somewhere up north. Um, obviously, try my best to go to more gigs, more festivals, all that good stuff. But just in general, you know, some just general lifestyle habits and we need to get re checked and looked over and just kind of you know get stuff back into some sort of resemblance of you know normality because at the moment it's just hard to be normal because you're just stuck in this weird purgatory and you know you're having to fight this weird war with people who don't exist on the internet it's just uh, come on give me hope but yeah, hope aside, I hope you guys are well. I hope you guys are doing good. If you're watching this via YouTube, do me a solid, do me a favor, smash that like button, hit subscribe, leave me a comment down below and ask me a question regarding the show. Leave me some inspiring words or some derogatory, inflammatory words, whatever you can spare. I will receive it happily, right? Any kind of human contact, regardless if you're trolling, if you're praising, if you're just hyping, give it to me, baby. I need human contact. I'm dying for it, as you can tell, right? I sound nuts right now. Sound like I'm added up, but I'm not. I'm just on this uh, black tar. You know what I mean? This liquid tar. I'm even drinking instant coffee. That's how bad it's getting, man. Huh? I'm like, ah. You know, instant coffee, the moment the temperature <laughs> decreases, the taste starts to just, you know? That's the good thing about getting actual coffee beans and grinding them. It's when it actually gets to room temperature or when you decide to put it in some ice cubes. That's when it tastes lovely. But instant coffee, ooh-wee! It tastes disgusting, mate. Disgusting. But anyway, regardless of that, hope you're doing well. If you, oh, Of course, if you're listening via the podcast, of course, leave me a five-star review and share with your friends. Please. Please. Okay, please. I beg of you. So many things to talk about. So many things to get into. Let's jump right on into the topics I have laid out today on the number one cultural and streetwear podcast in the world as voted by you, lovely folks. Let's get into it. Let's get into it. So, ba 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 Number one, we've got a Pop Smoke album cover update, right? We were on here laughing, giggling, kikiing about Virgil's um, apparent social faux pas, his inability to read the room, his um, confidence and arrogance that his design aesthetic is somehow way above our heads. And the public said, no, no, no. We hate your design. We think it's crap. We don't care if you design some really good Jordans. That cover is terrible. Pop Smoke is our beloved, um, lovable 
um, street goon who was taken away from us way too early and we don't want you to desecrate his memory by giving us an album cover that could have been designed on clip art two years ago right or something i don't know whatever yeah so now we've got some good news um the album cover has been redesigned obviously the album came out today i haven't listened to it just yet i want to listen to it in full like i do with all albums i put it on my system i listen to it in the background passively but i listen to it from the beginning to the end none of this skipping stuff none of this deleting tracks none of this you know skimming forward of the track i listen to every single one one way through then i pick out the ones that i like and i listen to those again so i can form my opinion on the music um i'm not telling you how to listen to stuff but i'm telling you what i do because you know what it's my show so the album cover this is what it looks like um and it's funny because after all the kind of rigmarole after you know um virgil doing his um best to kind of you know save his reputation which wasn't in, in danger really to be honest it's just a shitty album cover it happens in it everyone who catches an L. you decide to phone up theophilus london to get him to help him out um, i'm surprised he didn't call timothy chamelet like he did with the whole donation thing in it to help him connect with the kids but he calls up theophilus london tells him what's really going on Theophilus london gives us some fucking you know weird cryptic tweets about the real situation and what's really on the what really matters like thanks guys um and then in a weird turn of events, this guy called Ryder Rips who has um, a digital, cons uh, what do you call it? A meme sort of weird creative directing, creative director studio thing that I've seen online before. And, you know, a pre pretty prolific artist in his own right, has worked with Kanye in the past, came out and essentially trashed Virgil and said, oh, this guy's been stealing my design for years. He's an absolute fraud, blah, 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 blah. The internet went ablaze. And then, um, consequently 50 cent came out and then started going in on virgil posted a picture of his family on their wedding day and stuff which is just a mad low blow and of course that got the lead promptly from the internet because that's a little bit out, um, out of order and it's not very necessary just in general you can keep getting dunked on in it um and then it kind of settled down it got to a point where 50 cents then started um, uploading and sharing loads of images of album covers that were designed by fans and you know wannabe or uh graphic designers some of the stuff was a bit you know a bit cringe some of these graphic designers were trying way too hard to get their work kind of commissioned to be an album cover um i think some of them need to relax and take it a little bit of a chill pill but from it emerged a new album cover and guess who designed it Ryder rips himself the guy that was going to war with virgil who uploaded a full pdf document stating why he plagiarized him in the past and why he allowed it has now come out from the ground and decided to take the number one mantle as the lead creative on this pop smoke album cover and you know what the funny thing is virgil could have done this in his sleep virgil has the talent in his left finger to have done this in his sleep he decided not to and he got dunked on for an album cover that he could have done way better than and this is it on the screen so it's essentially a black rose i think it's 3d um it's a, yeah i think it's the, it's the same black rose that we saw for the single i think he rather rips did it for the single previously um essentially they've taken a still of it and it looks really amazing. It's sort of like chromatic style. Um, it reminds me of something that he would have done maybe for Grimes. But again, it's probably a little bit more tasteful than what Virgil would have done. I think it's really hard to make an album cover that encapsulates such a young artist who was taken from us way too soon. And um, you want to do it in a tasteful way. I'm not sure how tasteful it is to put the person's face front left and center of a posthum posthumous album however you pronounce that word. Um, I don't know, man. Something about it that makes it a bit uneasy. Do you remember... Um, was it Vanessa Bryant, right? Kobe Bryant's wife recently said she's um, um, explained why she was blocking loads of Kobe Bryant fan accounts that were tagging her. Oh no, she she was blocked. She was um, unfollowing and blocking loads of t Kobe Bryant fan accounts because they kept coming up in her in her explore page. Like the algorithm kept feeding her those accounts, and of course, you know, losing your husband and your daughter in such tragic circumstances, you don't really want to be reminded of it constantly. So, I'm a little bit. I don't know. It's like the murals, isn't it? Right. It's good for them to be up for a certain period of time but then you don't want them to be up all the time it can be a little bit of um it can be a little bit uneasy for the people that were closest to the person that passed away and i think this album cover is done in a really good way it kind of encapsulates his um essence a lot more um it does a good way of kind of representing who he was without really saying much of it and again like i said it's so disappointing for virgil because he could design this himself virgil was responsible for putting together probably one of the most important album covers in terms of general aesthetic going forward in hip-hop with two chains album cover do you remember the classic one uh with the two gold chains on the black bit of, on the black background so delightfully and exquisitely done this is during the time as well when people's album covers were super complicated and really uh, elaborate so for him to be so minimalistic and so to the point with that album cover so literal without being literal right it's kind of the extension of the kind of whole quotation marks thing that he does um explaining without explaining right um like a double meaning 
sort of like a the kank bot version of designing where you kind of you know you are against use you you think words are beneath you right um you want to communicate in memes and slogans and catchphrases and hot takes uh you are the master of misdirection that's what that album cover did right that two chains um with the two gold chains on the front album cover was all about i'm not sure what album was that one with the two gold chains was it i forgot what title was that uh two chains we see that one two chains with the two gold chains uh two which with a virgil cover let's see come on two chains virgil cover bapity bapity ba Bapidi bapidi ba bapidi two chains based on a true story that's the one okay cool so he designed the based on the truth of it that's 2012 god damn it man 2012 really was that when he designed it that is a madness bro but yeah um it's a shame really for him in it like that's like i said i think he could design any sleep and he really fucked it up by um you know deciding to go a completely different way um what can you do really in it what can you do uh let me see where i can get it let me show you it again is it here where are you no back onto a lid da, da, da. and then um of course um steven victor jumped in and decided to essentially defend virgil's honor regarding the whole situation which is funny in itself um he allowed because i think they could have done a bit more to um i think they kind of threw virgil under the bus again not a fan of the dude personally think you know he has his he has his faults like we all do but I think they could have done a lot better to insulate him from the kind of online barrage he was getting. But I guess they didn't want to come into contact with the activists who essentially don't like Virgil and are using any slight, any misstep he does. He should, I think Virgil should be aware. Someone in his team needs to tell Virgil that there's people out there that are uh, cons not conspiring, but will be more than happy to see him essentially fall um, from his um, platform be more than happy and, and replace him with somebody that they uh, they kind of deem to be more uh deserving of the platform that he's got i think that's what's going on right now they'd much rather like a pyre must be there they'd much rather than i don't know who else do they like in that scene loads of other people i can't think of them off the top of my head but i'm, I'm assuming they kind of just don't like the fact that he's on that platform and you know they, he's not necessarily the kind of black person they'd want there they want somebody else one of their friends who's a bit more activist orientated maybe is a little bit more forward facing with their political views uh maybe is actively doing stuff in the scene to kind of you know push the narrative of black lives matter i don't know but it's quite obvious that people just want virgil to burn and they want him to crumble and fall again not sure because he's just ascended so quickly so far no not not no, i'm not sure if not because he's ascended so quickly or because it's association with kanye or but I don't think this Kanye thing is true because Kanye is getting a lot of love with this whole gap um, collab he's done. And, you know, he basically um, put together a whole different team to kind of lead the creative direction or the artistic vision for the whole gap collaboration. And I'm not sure just hiring a couple of creative directors who happen to be black is going to get you in the good graces with woke black Twitter. But I don't know, man. There's something about this Virgil hate that seems weird, isn't it? I wonder what it is. Why, what, what? Because again, from the inner streetwear scene, it's pretty easy to understand. I think a lot of people in streetwear could just say, hey, they don't think he's good. They think he's a bit shit. Um, they think he got where he got to with his connections. Um, the whole, you know, Ralph Lauren, Ralph Polo rugby shirt thing debacle was uh, something that people got annoyed by off white in general as a proposition for a streetwear brand serving the kids when everything is priced five hundred dollars up was a bit of an insult. Um, you know, him being classed as some sort of leader of the streetwear of the new school of streetwear was also an insult considering how quickly he was to kind of shoo shoo away from it. Um, and all those things, right? Streetwear, you can understand. I'd guess. Fashion world, you can also understand, right? Young black dude from Chicago um, gets a job working at Louis Vuitton, kind of jumps over all these steps, um, surpasses, every, doesn't go to fashion school, defies all, you know, regular convention. But then I just don't understand or can't pinpoint where the hate would come from black Twitter. Is it because he's got white wife? I don't know. Is that the thing? I don't think that is because I think something that's something the internet has only realized recently, it feels like. Um, what could it possibly be? I don't know. If, any, if anyone in the guys you know what the what the reason actually now is why Virgil seems to be getting a lot of hate online you know every mis any mistake he does just gets amplified and you know essentially gets broadcasted out there and made them and twisted and the narrative gets manipulated some way shape or form 
Um, and people seem to be really happy when he fucks up as well, which seems to be incredibly odd. Um, yeah, I wonder what, what what's the reason behind that. I don't know. But yeah, Steven Victor didn't help the situation, I think. He kind of crumbled or back bad under pressure from the mob, um, responded to all the memes and said, you know, we're listening. And someone put a change petition, change petition up and people signed that in order to kind of change the album cover. I think it got like 25,000 signatures on it. Um, and yeah, he put up a little post to sort of, I don't know, rectify himself or to sort of, you know, a bit of damage control. But it's too late now. You know, everyone said what they said. But the post is the following. It says screen cap, I think, of a video Virgil did for Pop Smoke or a, a music video I'm assuming he directed. And it says the following on the caption. It says, by the way, we love Virgil. Virgil is the first person of African descent to lead Louis Vuitton uh, menswear line. Virgil is a pioneer and therefore a hero. We need black superheroes now more than ever. Yeah, but not really, is it? That's what we're seeing with Black Lives Matter. We're seeing they want certain black superheroes, you know. What's his face? Um, what's that white guy that pretends to be black? He can get away with absolute murder, but then the moment Virgil Abloh designs a pretty shitty album cover, he's decried as an enemy of flipping black humanity. It's really, you know, it's a little bit suspect, this whole um, thing that's going on at the moment. They're eating themselves, isn't it? Uh, Virgil's a pioneer, and therefore a hero. We need more black superheroes. He said, 21,000 people signed up for change position. We heard you, right? And he says, keep that same energy for Brianna Taylor or Elijah McLean in every election. Um, Victor, Victor dot vote save America. Okay, we get it, right? That end bit, I just think is a bit. How do I describe it? It's a bit discourteous, isn't it? Really, right? I hate when people do that. I think the office under was doing is too. Oh, everyone needs to focus on the real things at hand. It's like no, no, no. Just because you didn't get the reaction you wanted doesn't mean you can now tell the public how they should be reacting. If that Virgil cover would have come out and everyone would have said, oh, what a genius, right? He would have been retweeting, sharing stuff, you know, sucking himself off and whatever it may be. And his friends would have all banded around saying, oh, this is the person leading the charge. All this sort of wanky stuff that those circle jerk guys do, right? But the moment it doesn't capture the public's attention, for whatever reason, let's say it's just a matter of taste or just a matter of appeal, whatever, we don't care the reason behind it. They suddenly start going, oh, well, you guys need to worry about the real things. The real things? You weren't even worrying about the real things 10 minutes ago yourself, mate. Whilst you were perusing Essence, buying another Balenciaga jumper. You aren't worried about the real things yourself. What are you talking about? It's insane, man. This kind of level of arrogance that somehow only a certain group of people are allowed to have an opinion uh, upon um, the artistic expression that you put out there for the public to consume. Just because they don't like it, suddenly they don't get it. It's like, come on, man. This is, I don't know, man. All those guys are really annoying. I just find that all oh, I've I've been surrounded by that personality so often. I'm so happy I kind of pulled that pull myself out of it. It didn't help me probably career wise in the long run, right? The, my inability to um, navigate that scene and to kind of you know just be pally pally and suck people off and you know just be you know for lack of a better term and sort of like a how would you say tolerate that sort of personality has hindered my career career progression i'm sure of it but i'm 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 willing to make that sacrifice i'm willing to do i'm willing to bargain with that i'm willing to i am because i couldn't sleep at night knowing that you know i sucked a grown man off so i can you know get a guest list spot to a certain party or so i could have first dibs for a certain item when it comes out i just couldn't do it i really couldn't i've i've grown up with too many of my i've grown up idolizing too many of the heroes of the no the actual leaders and the fault you know, provokers and the absolute pioneers in the scene who roast you, James Jebby, Aaron Bondorov, um, Hayes, Futura, all these flipping icons that I've followed and read the interviews of who've kind of did it on their own beat, right? Um, Chris Gibbs, all these amazing people, Noah Babesian. Like, I'm not going to then succumb to some sort of weird, you know, fanboyish consumerist idea of that world where you're suddenly just praising everything these people do and then you know they can't do no wrong you sheepily follow every step they do you change your mind based on what they're thinking fair weather it's like nah it's, it's not for me and of course this scene this streetwear scene is bigger than the personalities right it's a whole thing it's a whole movement it's a whole way of life it's a philosophy um it shouldn't be just you know encapsulated by a certain person or you should just respect somebody based on just some work they did it should just be all encompassing and again it should be the actions really you know it shouldn't be what they say it should be the actions and for for lack of a better thing as well the thing the, the reason as well to end this the reason why I think this is sort of unfair with Virgil too. The kind of out, outcry and reaction is that if you look at it really, right, outside of some of the optics with his, you know, design studio in Milan for Off-White, which, you know, you have to get into it contextually and understand what the fashion scene and industry is like in Milan and Italy. Uh, you have to understand, you know, 
the multicultural aspect that goes on there which is you know it's a little bit difficult to get into but it's not as much as people think it would be so why would there be that many black people in the studio in the first place um the cost and the requirements needed to get people from the u.s to work in europe there's loads of things that go in there right get that aside the guy does a lot for black people he does a lot for his friends forget black people he does a lot for his friends he's one of those people that legitimately could say he doesn't see color because he just wants in essentially he's like a clout exchanger but in a good way right he's very willing to give you like if you've got clout he would exchange his clout coins with you kind of take a picture post it up tag you all that good stuff upload your stuff on these instagram stories the stuff that all those people care about right in that world they care about the the the, the look right um the credit um the tag he does that willingly he's happy to do it and i think that side of him doesn't really get sh uh, propped up enough and it should do, it should do because a lot of people in his position would be a lot more would be a way more greedier with their clout or with their um, notoriety with their success with their access than he is he's really really generous with it so i think that's an unfair side of it but again i just think he's stepping in his he's stepping in it all the time he's you know i don't know why he seems to be so relentless he seems to be really hell bent on proving black twitter wrong and if you've, there's one thing that i've realized with this whole cancel culture stuff is you can't really try and fight the mob you just got to continue doing your thing so if you like you know terry cruz is probably going through the same situation now right he says some kukaneni stuff here and there but for the most part you kind of get what his sentiment is but he's just not the flavor of the month he seems to be one of those black people that people don't like they kind of class him alongside it seem class him in the same category as the candace owens he just needs to accept his role and just say the stuff which he's doing i think a lot better now he just says says say what you want to say say it with your chest but don't expect people to understand you because they just don't like you same with the virgil do what you want to do uh you know approach a design you know aesthetic in whatever way you choose best whatever it may be but don't go up phoning for office london and asking him to post flipping screenshots of your phone call it's just so wanky with that stuff we don't need that just keep doing your thing pushing things forward use your and again for the kids that get it they look at him for it as an example and see the cool the good things he's doing for the kids that don't the kids about that don't like him they're never gonna change their mind so what can you do what can you do anyway let's move on next on the list what else do we have here we have you have to love the hawks more yeah i thought this was a really nice wholesome tweet hawks more put out in preparation for the openings of restaurants and bars on saturday the 4th of july what a great time to open a restaurant and a bar right objectively speaking 4th of july of course we don't celebrate you know independence day but it falls on a saturday that's the thing that i really is curious about when it comes to the america's uh approach or north america's approach to coronavirus right they are uh, such a jovial nation right they love a good celebration they love a good holiday they love a good public holiday right you'd assume some of the politicians would use that as a carrot of being like hey guys if you're on your best behavior if we really try and knock this thing out of the park and just hang hunker down lock down get everything in order we could beat this or kind of stem the tire so that i can open a few places that would be sick in it but they didn't do that they just completely ignored it and like ah, it'll go away if i don't pay attention to it it'll go away but it's, it's the kind of equivalent of putting your head in the sand essentially right hoping it would go away and it, and it hasn't and then now they've got an actual reason to go outside right with fourth of july weekend coming up and they can't go outside because you know they flipped they, they messed up and i guess we have the same sort of responsibility looming over our heads too as you know citizens of this great united kingdom that we live in we need to really be responsible when we go out there so i guess if you're going to be in a club i guess if you're going to go to a pub this weekend tr you shouldn't be sitting indoors right try your best to take your drinks outside uh, you know it's really lovely weather out there now you know make sure you social distance and all that good stuff and just enjoy your drink and enjoy the company of your friends and being surrounded by the ambience of strangers that's that's enough isn't it you don't need to be sitting indoors in a pub or something if you want to go to a restaurant fair enough do your thing but in a pub it's just not necessary because you spend way more time in a pub than you do in a restaurant i'd imagine on average right on average how long do people spend in restaurants like an hour hour 30 in a pub must be like two hours depending on what kind of group or the amount of people in your groups we really owe to ourselves we can't mess this up man we really can't. And Hawksmore gave us a good, um, a good little uh, tweet thread about the importance of restaurants and the the place they serve in society. And I want to read it to you now. This is a, a run of tweets from the Hawksmore now. It says the following. Oh, again, if you don't know the Hawksmore, they're a really exquisite steakhouse. They have a couple of restaurants in London, a few outside of London too. I went to the one in Manchester, I went to the one in London. Like, exquisite. One of the best restaurants I've been to. Probably the, one of the biggest reasons why 
I would go back and work for a corporation, right? When I used to work at Nike, that's a f- one of the places that we went to to go, you know, our kind of end of quarter team bonding thing. That's a good thing about working for a corporation, right? They uh, give your manager um, a, a bank card and essentially tell them, hey, if you want to do a bit of corporate bonding, you can do it on our dime. And it doesn't really matter where you go. Just make sure you invoice us. Or just, just make sure you expense it all. And it's just like, it's beautiful, isn't it? And, you don't, and again, you don't have to expense it. You just have to just take their card and use that. All the drinks that you want, it's flipping amazing. That was that was literally the only, that and the discounts at Nike was one of the best things about it. Everything else was, nah, not the best experience. But hey, look at me now. So it continues. This is a friend. It says, um, the Hawks from London says the following. In advance of this weekend and our subsequent reopening on the 9th at Borough, I thought it might be worth reintroducing you to the concept of a restaurant. So, restaurants, a friend. Lovely picture there of Hawksmoor in, um, what's that place called? In Shoreditch. Boom. So, the following. A restaurant serves food uh, made by professionals who are trained all their lives to make it well. There's lots of choices, but the best bit is that what you want to eat for dinner on Friday wasn't decided 10 days previously on Sainsbury's.com, but 50 minutes before based on what you want. Yeah, very true. You've got a lovely picture here of all the goodness there from Hawksmoor. Poached egg on sourdough. You've got, what's that? Uh, what was that thing called again? Um, when they serve it and it's bloody hell, what's that called? A steak? Sunday brunch, whatever it's called. You've got a bit of cod there. You've got steak and fries. Not sure what that is on the left. And then you've got a tiramisu there, something else. So just a lovely plate of food, right? Gorgeously done. Next tweet. In fact, you don't have to shop at all. The restaurant does all that for you. You only need to think about whether the... whether. The only... So the restaurant does that. And you only need to think about whether they'll like you do... What? Whether you feel like you do about what tastes nice where to buy from and the ethics of it all and where is responsible price. If you've been before, you don't have to decide again. Very, very true. And there's a lovely box of fresh uh, veggies there for you to take. <sighs> lovely. Um, it says, from these chefs, um, right, not only are they trained, but they don't give you that look that says, we've cooked, so you wash up. And even if they are messy, they are not, but get this, you don't care. Very, very true. And there's a, a cast of all the chefs that work at Hawksmoor. Lovely little profile pictures of the team there that are employed to serve you all that steaky goodness. Oh, I'm sweating. That's getting really warm. Boom, 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 boom. Lovely to see. Next tweet we have. They aren't the only people in the restaurant. People are there who are always pleased to see you when you come in. Uh, they do things like take your coat, bring your food and check if you're okay. They never shout your name up the stairs or make you feel like you're not good enough. <sighs> and that's the thing that i miss mostly right just being waited on right just being pampered uh being made feel special by strangers right who are paid to do so i miss that so much honestly i think about the other day once i go to a restaurant again and have a lovely steak and a glass of red wine i'm gonna give that server a big fat tip i'm gonna be so happy to be there again right any pleasantries just a little how are you hope you're well i'm gonna just divulge my life story and be like oh thank you for asking i've been really up i've been really under the weather my hay fever has flared up a little bit and i've been drinking way too much coffee during the day you know just kind of died <laughs> <laughs> verbal diarrhea to a complete stranger because I'm missing out on so much human contact like god damn it I miss it and look at all their lovely faces right all these strangers who just look jovial and happy to see you happy to kind of give you their love happy to give you their hospitality they're trained in making you feel good about yourself as you're gouging and pl- plundering yourself in their lovely steaky goodness oh Another one. At a restaurant, no one raises an eyebrow and says, already? Or another one? If you fancy a drink. Well, only if you had gone a bit far. And even if that is... And even if it's... And even... And even then, it's for your own good. And restaurants have almost every drink you can imagine, and yet more trained professionals. That's the other bit that's really lovely, isn't it? When you go into a restaurant and you don't know what you want to drink, you don't know what you want to eat, and you say to the person, hey, I like this and this sort of stuff. Okay, oh yeah, by the way, if you go to a restaurant and you don't know what you want, at least give them a, an idea of what you don't like, right? Or the things that you do like. Just give them some sort of framework that they can work with. I know from some friends that, you know, have worked in hospitality before, the most annoying thing was when people just don't have any idea and you somehow have to choose for them. And then when you do, they don't like it. It's just, you know, one of the most preposterous things ever. Try and give them something to work with. But I love just being like, hey, I'm eating this. What do you think will pair well with this sort of um, meal that I'm eating? They'll give you a couple of options. It'll be a, a process of, el- of elimination and boom, you get a new drink, a new cocktail that you would have never imagined that you liked. And suddenly you've got a new drink to add to your list of drinks that you like now. Imagine. Something that you can make at home, something that you can order somewhere else, something that you can come back and reorder with your friends and look cool and sophisticated. 
All right, you go over and you beckon over your favorite waiter or waitress and say, "Hey, nice to see you again." They, ex you know, exchange a pleasantry with you, even if they don't remember who the hell you are. They know you're showing off to your friends, so they kind of indulge you. And then, guess what? At the end of the day, you all tip them very, very well, and they're happy to see you the next time. <sighs> Miss it so much. And it continues. It says. They're basically really nice, clean, well-run places. They have people in them. They might uh, sound odd now, but you'll get used to it. Trust me. It's the future and it's glorious. <laughs> I love this post, man. It's a really good primer to kind of introduce people back to the concept of being in a restaurant. Because I think that's what happened in America, right? In America, they had a little spike. No, in America, they had a, a couple of, let's say, maybe a few weeks of no spiking cases, right? This was really... Um, against any kind of logic no one really understood why there were anti-lockdown protesters there were obviously the riots and the protests that happened as a consequence of George Floyd's untimely passing and no one could really understand why aren't the numbers spiking up nothing was nothing was really happening so a lot of restaurants um, opened up sometimes against uh, state rule so they could they could um, take advantage of the tourism season or tourist season which was already ending they can make a bit of money and just be of service to their community and what actually happened was that a lot of the places had you know know some queues the first couple of days or the first couple of weeks but then it sort of petered out a bit when the cases started to spike up again or when just people started to become a little bit more um hesitant about going out right they're a bit worried so a lot of these restaurants are not only going to have to just it's not it's not enough just reopening your doors you're going to have to somehow try and give consumers confidence try and make them feel assured that what you've done everything that you can to make the place safe and it's okay to go back in that's the most that's the hardest bit of the job, really. I think it's all well and good reopening everything and Boris saying, oh, you know, be responsible, oh, all this sort of stuff and um, uh, be alert. But it's really going to take a lot for the for us to collectively be okay to go back outside again. But I think this is a good way to start from the Hawksmoor. Definitely a good way. It continues, uh, last one. It says, because in the end, restaurants aren't really about food. They're about people. The ones you love, the ones you work with, the ones you don't know, uh, the ones who are looking after you. And I know that that's a group in particular are excited about the return to restaurants. Try it. A lovely heart. Look at that plate of food. Oh, give me that so much. A lovely steak there. Um, oh, I can't watch that. I can't look at that too much. Oh, God. And that's so true. It's such a good point, right? Restaurants aren't about food. The same with clubs. Clubs really aren't about... It's not really about the music, and it? It's about the people. Right? That's what um, I've learned my lesson when it comes to live streams online at the moment, right? Um, I've kind of been getting annoyed with them, right? They've they're, they're, they're been making me... Um, I just get pissed off when I watch them, really, right? Because I'm not allowed outside. I can't go to a nightclub anymore, or none of us can. I'm not just saying it's to do with me, but... Because essentially, part of the reason why clubs are fun because of the people, right? That's what makes watching Boiler Room fun. Seeing all of the Hmong that people in the crowd. Um, seeing the DJ Clang. Seeing um, one of the hosts sort of push the crowd back. All those things that you see in real life is what makes it fun. Um, you don't really, you know, I don't know. You don't really give a shit if somebody's just standing alone playing some music. Unless, I think the only way it'd work is if that was happening whilst we were at work and it was allowed to go out. I think having that in the background and having the ability to watch a live radio stream online as you're just sitting at home, as you're sitting at work, listening to the music in the background is great. But doing it just now, it's just like, oh, I don't know, man. But yeah, what do I know? Good, good, good uh, message from Hawksmoor. Thank you so much for it. We can't wait to get back to restaurants. And again, if you haven't been to the Hawksmoor, uh, one of the best steakhouses in the UK, definitely recommend you try it out. One of my favorite places to go to. A great place to celebrate an anniversary, celebrate a birthday, or just go get some dinner in the evenings. Because why not? You're not spending your money on anything else anyway, so you might as well treat yourself. <coughs> you know what I mean? You might as well. Okay, let's move on. What else do we have here to talk about things that I thought were of interest to you? Uh, a bit of reverse cancellation here. Yeah, this was quite funny, isn't it? This girl decided to go on a bit of a rant online um, about All Lives Matter. It's just really boring now, all this sort of division, right? You just would hope to be a bit more unity, but hey, what can you do? And in an uns in, in a surprising reversal of consequences, usually when somebody from the left criticizes, no, somebody from the left criticizes somebody from the right, usually the left wins, right? So if you say something, you know, fairly anti-white no one's really going to criticize you for the most part because everyone kind of you know has come under this everyone believes in this kind of collective narrative of like white man bad right white supremacy bad let's replace all the whites with the blacks and the coloreds and we're all you know we'll live in some weird cultural utopia which is mad but hey what do i know 
So usually that's what happens, right? And but then if you're on the right and you say something derogatory about the left and what they're doing, usually you get cancelled unless you've got a lot of money, right? Like I said before, cancel culture doesn't exist unless you have money and then you have like a dedicated fan base. If you have money, that like cash supplies, cash reserves, sorry, and you have a dedicated fan base, it's literally impossible to cancel you. You only have to look at Ian Connor, um, Piers Morgan. <laughs> um, who else is a good person that people try and cancel a lot? Sal and Sugar. Um, I don't know. Loads of, loads of, even Joe Rogan's a good example, right? Loads of cash reserves and a dedicated fan base. You can never be cancelled. But the left have the kind of, I'd say the, yeah, the left leaning, the left leaning people have a lot more of the collective consciousness at the moment, right? There's a lot more of collective support. Hollywood supports them. Various industries support them. Corporations are all posting stuff about Black Lives Matter. It seems to be a lot more, you know, support that way, which is great. But this is a weird twist in fortune. So this girl goes on a rant um, against All Lives Matter people, says she's going to stab them, which is kind of half-jokingly, you know, it's not like a thing. And then her place of work decides to fire her based on that video she posted, which is really interesting turn of events because is that a weird way of... The place of what she works for saying that they are anti all lives matter message or is it just them kind of reacting to the outcry and be like hey we can't associate with somebody who's going to go and rants online and you know spew such you know mad jokes just in case they do that against us i don't know but this is the video itself i'm going to play in the background so you guys can hear it hopefully i get up here on the screen as well for you guys to see bear with me one second ba -ba 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 -ba. I press play there you go. Trump supporters took my job away from me. <laughs> I've gotten death threats, rape threats, violent threats. It was okay. But now it doesn't like my future. FYI, right? Just as before the video carries on. I think I've always said this. Anyone that can cry on camera whilst recording a video, selfie camera too, so you're seeing yourself crying is a complete psychopath like a complete psychopath i just don't understand it because you know when you see yourself crying you feel more ridiculous or you just start sobbing more but the last thing you want to do is record that uh, um event of you more of you sobbing even more than you were previously you're not going to do that it just looks embarrassing so psychopath one psychopath two the inability to understand or to accept your part in the issue right she goes on this rant which is fairly innocuous. It's a bit of a joke, wherever it may be, right? In that kind of, you know, um, clappy sort of like, if you guys say this sort of thing again, I'm going to stab you, right? It's sort of like that in that jokey, TikToky way. It's not serious. She's obviously not, she's obviously kind of um, being a bit of a cultural commentator troll. I don't know, whatever. It's, it's not really big of a deal. But to suggest somehow that you didn't get fired due to anything that you did and it's just some sort of people conspiring against you is mad, isn't it? But that's, a, that's the problem we have in general with society it seems like everyone's under their own little delusion whatever side of the aisle you fall on whatever political whatever polit whatever side on the political scale you're on you you have your own uh, self-delusion it's sort of like internal narrative that you have running and anything that goes against that is just kind of whatever it's noise it's fake news it's like huh you recorded the video of yourself you know saying a bit a bit pretty racist racy joke and a corporate company that doesn't want any unnecessary attention being cast upon them because they probably have a lot of skeletons in their clothes it was like nah you're out it's pretty standard practice really isn't it? i don't know i don't expect why you were surprised or <coughs> i think you're allowed to cry because you lose your job but to somehow say that you know these trump supporters are the ones that made you lose your job is like mm, did they really or did you lose your job yourself because you recorded the video don't get me wrong i'm sure a lot of those people on the right who don't like her political views would have been tagging her company in their posts online and stuff right saying you know the kind of you know, tittle uh, tittle things that people do now online where they sort of say, oh, I can't believe um, Microsoft endorses somebody that will say this message. Have you guys seen this video? That sort of stuff. Or, oh, I, I really wish this video wouldn't trend so they wouldn't see this. So that sort of like nonsense. But to suggest that you had no part in it is really, really insane. My future is entirely compromised because Trump supporters have decided to go for my life. <laughs> God, and let's be let, and let's relax too she, they didn't come for your life you got fired you'll be fine right it's come for your life as if you like where do these people grow up where you're you're under some sort of um what do you call it you feel like your life is legitimately in danger because people type mean words about you on the internet where did you grow up where you think that's a reality real threats to your life are real in that 
you know when they come. You know when they come in, and sometimes you don't know because that's how real it is, right? If someone really wants to get you, you have no idea it's coming. To somehow equate mean words or retweets online as violence is bizarre. Look, guys, I'm too strong for you. Oh yeah, I'm you're too crying. Strong for too strong, any of you, all lives matter. Raises Trump supporters. It sucks, but it doesn't suck as much as systemic racism. And I'm not gonna stop using my platform to advocate for it. And I'm so you know what suck? All these slogans, Black Lives Matter, All Lives Matter, it all sucks. It's annoying because it just divides us all, innit? Especially now, I was thinking about it the other day, actually. I was like, you know what's really a missed opportunity with this whole Black Lives Matter resurgence and movement? It could have been kind of, it, so, it, you know what it could have been, what could have been done with it, which would have been really helpful. Imagine with the resurgence of Black Lives Matter due to the unfortunate passing of George Floyd, right? A really tragic situation births this amazing cultural societal revolution where finally people wake up and say, wow, the police brutality thing is a bit, a bit extreme, right? And why does it seem as if like it's kind of um, disproportionately affecting blacks? Okay, cool. Why? Oh, because they live in um, what you call it, dilapidated neighborhoods. They haven't got many career, um, um, what you call it, um, goals or aspirations or things that they can do. So they, they result to crime, which then leads to them being overly policed in their areas, which leads to more way more interactions with the police, which leads to police violence, which leads to la la la. There's a really cool situation we have here, right? And then you could extrapolate that and say, oh, the police brutality happens in every single state right where there's a high proportion of people who live underneath a certain level of poverty right whether they're white um latino whatever it is it happens everywhere so let's address that right well let's let's address the actual problem here it's the battle between the haves and the haves not but instead it's been propagated and essentially pushed as some weird thing to sort of replace white um what you call it c-suite upper management with black people or with people from various minority groups. It's like, that isn't what we want. We don't want to just fire people and give other people jobs. This is about changing the entire um, infrastructure, right? So that you can allow certain minorities to upwardly mobile them. So to get to a different place in terms of their aspirations for their family, to move to different parts of the country, to maybe get a bank loan to start a business, right? That's what you want, right? For your minority groups. You don't want them just to give a couple of people C-suite executive jobs or hire them in a diversity um, quota uh, initiative. That's not what we want. That's ridiculous, isn't it? Really? That's a, that's the real crying shame of this situation. It could have been really a good way to kind of galvanize everyone under it. Because if you see those early protests as well, right? It was so diverse. There was probably a lot more white people in those protests, especially depending on where you were, where you saw the videos, right? Depending on what country they were. But there's a real collective kind of like agreement of like, nah, this is enough. This also needs to be kind of an attack on the state, an attack on government, an attack of local councils, blah, blah, blah. This is, you know, attacking every kind of um, tier of authority and government. Instead, it's been replaced as some sort of re uh, reparations in employment or something. And now we have this weird war between all lives and black lives. And now there's that blue lives matter thing with the, la with the blue line. Is it all lives matter with the blue line of the American flag? It's just like so ridiculous and yuck, isn't it? Sorry, Deloitte, that you can't see that. <laughs> that you are cowardice enough to fight somebody who's going to make an indelible change in the world. And she sounds like a... To have an impact. She sounds like a little... She sounds like a little girl, innit? Like a really infantile person. I'm gonna have such a big impact. Mummy and Daddy said I'm special. So, like, mm, really? The next person who has the sheer nerve, the sheer entitled caucasity to say all lives matter, I'm gonna stab you. I'm gonna, I'm gonna stab you. And while you're struggling and bleeding out, I'm going to show you my paper cut and say, my cut matters too. You know what's funny about it, right? It's clearly a joke. And you see how much she's aged <laughs> in just a couple of days. She was way more younger in that uh, uh, TikTok video than she does lying in her bed while she's crying, isn't it? Well, you shouldn't have pissed off the whites, isn't it? That's what happens when you piss off the whites. <laughs> they come for your job like everyone else does. Bloody hell, man. Cancel culture. What can you do? Anyway, moving on. Oh, yeah, I watched Berlin Calling, man. What a great movie. I watched Berlin Calling last week. No, this week. Yeah, this week. Yeah, early in the week. I watched Berlin Calling. Finally got around to watching it. Um, It's a pretty, pretty, what, you call, what would you say? Pretty monumental, pretty influential staple yeah it's it's a, it's a pretty important movie when it comes to club culture and electronic music i think it was probably one of the first movies that perfectly encapsulated european 
electronic or dance music scene I've, obviously we've, we have our sort of like um, domestic movies like 24 hour party people that was a really good primer in terms of understanding what was going on in the rave scene encapsulating it in a movie but I think Berlin Calling was the first sort of thing mass market got to see about what was going on with this whole techno tourism thing what was going on in Europe um, I think it was just about what probably the same time you know we were seeing videos of like love parade all that sort of good stuff so um, of course um, it follows um the, the the makings of a DJ who essentially goes a bit nuts and gets succumbed to the cold gets a, he succumbs to the perils of the scene right gets lost in the source somewhat goes a bit mad and te- ends up in a insane asylum and in, and through that it, he goes on a kind of a personal metaphysical sort of like musical journey right so this is rediscovering himself and what he's about um all all in the backdrop of like the berlin techno scene right it's a really really incredible movie i think um maybe not in the plot uh that's probably you know a bit by the by but i think the way that it sort of encapsulates the scene like weirdly at you know thematically and maybe texturally and uh, just the, the sounds and the images and the weird awkward scenes and the haphazard nature of the main protagonist it's just a really good movie it's a, probably again the best representation i think of club culture that i've seen in a while man really really expertly done um i can't recommend it anymore um one of the bits that really i was really that kind of struck with me was the scene in the toilet where he's talking to the blonde girl the, the couple of you know the first two interactions that they have there and the conversations that they're having very much um you know resonates with me and my experiences i've had in various uh metal clad uh, bathrooms with random people you end up meeting right when you spend like 20 30 minutes talking in a bathroom plotting life plans added people on facebook and all that sort of good stuff right um and of course the fact that he gets lost in the source i think is a really good um cautionary tale really good cause to tell you know this idea that because I, I don't know i think when you get exposed to the, that that scene dance music electronic music there is something sort of ephemeral about it right this idea that you can essentially suspend all this or belief you can essentially become you know uh your version of peter pan right you don't really age in a scene you sort of just progress your fans stick with you it's not as it's not the most fickle of industries either which is really beneficial <coughs> Of course, it's really difficult to stay at the top, top, right? To be like a major selling <coughs> dance music act and still kind of re- remain relevant throughout the years, throughout the decades. But if you want to maintain a fan base and tour and make albums and do some edits and remixes, you can easily do that in the electronic music scene without having to um, resort to sounding like the young kids or doing anything gimmicky. It's one of the only scenes that kind of allows an artist to grow older and also it allows you sort of to mature, discover new sounds whilst you're... St- kind of fan base remains relatively the same for the most part which is really great to see um i saw that especially when i went to see richie horton play at the um, at fold sometime be- sometime before the end of last year for his new album that come out look compilation album for his record label right and you look around the crowd and there was some people there who obviously have been following richie horton you know forever forever some actual older people with their earplugs and standing at the back just listening to it not really getting involved in the dancing and stuff just treating it more as a gig you got a lot of industry professionals there so it was a real good primary say okay cool this is what it looks like when you're richie horton's age right what your crowd looks like it includes someone like me it includes some younger sort of like cooler hip-hop people it involves some industry professionals that work in the dance music industry it includes some people that have been with you you know since you are a dj in detroit it's a really diverse range whereas maybe you know your more contemporary rapper indie artist has to kind of consistently be keeping abreast of what's going on in the scene and sort of like changing your artistic expression based on what's happening you can probably stay this you know you can p- remain pretty consistent i think of somebody like a ricardo Velobos, lobos right his sound has evolved somewhat but it's sort of the same right um and fans love him for that and i think that's probably one of the benefits of dance music scene i think this kind of movie encapsulates it but also shows again the the negative side of it right you can get lost in the source you can maybe indulge yourself way too much in the party life side of it which is really fun that's a problem with it it's really fun and for some people it can be uh, a hindrance but some people it could also be a, a source of inspiration right those kind of late nights in random people's houses after your set those those occasions in the green room they can be moments where you can how can i say 
it can be moments of inspiration where you can somehow pluck things out that can kind of um, impact or influence just the way you play the music you make, your approach to stuff. Um, so it, it's really hard to separate the both of them. But I think the real superpower, I think, comes in the ability to treat it a bit like a job, but also be a little bit loose with it. So the idea that you can kind of go to a, a gig, go to your club appearance or whatever it may be, do your show completely sober, don't indulge in anything. Um, I don't know, if you're going to go collaborate someone and make a track somewhere, you know try your best to do it you know sober too so that you can feel because that's what i think that's what happens usually when you indulge yourself too much in a party lifestyle you lose your feeling you lose your ability to kind of connect in an emotional level um in a metaphysic level maybe you kind of lose that it kind of stumps that barrier it's all which makes sense isn't it because when you get drunk you, you get a bit loose you get a bit wild but being sober and then being in that environment especially with all that kind of visual audio stimuli the lights everyone around you it can bring out a really amazing side of you like i remember when i first started dj that was the one of the things i did to kind of combat my fear of crowds i would only i, I would never drink before a set even during it i wouldn't drink i just want to be completely sober feel all the awkwardnesses of all, only having a couple of people dancing Sing, the awkwardness of playing maybe the wrong track of clanging and just feel everything right so that when i play the next time and i kind of gained a bit of experience i could then feel what the next song was i could then feel what the vibe was calling for right but when you stump that or when you kind of hinder that kind of feeling with drugs and alcohol it can maybe lead to some stale appearances some really weird times i think we've all seen it when you've gone see the big dj and they've obviously indulged you can obviously clearly see they've you know they've got a bit too loose with the source before the gig and the sets can be a little bit haphazard they sometimes find their way but it can really affect how you see an artist but honestly man i think it was this is obviously a legendary scene where he sort of loses his mind and goes a bit crazy um but honestly man it's a really really great movie i really recommend you check it out again great soundtrack um the plot again isn't really worth shouting home about but just in terms of a film that captures the um, the peaks and the valleys of being a touring dj act it's really one of the best i've watched honestly and again i was putting it off for a long time because i just didn't want to be i didn't want to be reminded of just how far away we are from having this again you know um being in a closed environment such as a club and being exposed to a dj standing on top of a stage somewhere playing some of our best beats while we you know spin around in circles talking to strangers we just met like they're our best friends it's gonna be a long time until that happens but yeah um definitely check out berlin calling man one of my um favorite movies i think so far in terms of encapsulating cup culture i can't recommend it anymore <clears throat> move on next one this what else do you have here <clears throat> oh yeah let's end it. this is really funny yeah let's end it. this let's end with this one man oh man <clears throat> you've got to love a bit of corona karma right i think that's what's happening i'm gonna dub it corona karma i think because we're spending so much time at home we are glued to our phones we've got nothing else to do but to browse the internet browse social media and just con and just consume content we are noticing far more the dickheads that exist in our society they are evident to us we can just see them from a mile off we can smell them we know what they look like their actions how they speak it's obvious they expose themselves right it is what it is and we're also seeing the exposure of some people's weird views on COVID, right? Um, it seems that there's a part of the population that just refuses to believe it's a thing, or there's a part of the population that seems to diminish or seems to somehow want to um, tell us that we're overreacting, right? They believe in it, but they think it's not that big of a deal. If you're young, you get it, you'll be all right, you'll be fine. Cool, no problem. But then these same people are the ones who are pushing for everything to reopen, which I don't really get. There's a cognitive dissonance there happening, right? You want everyone to get back to normal, but then you're refusing to do whatever it takes to get that to get that to happen, right? That's the odd thing. So some of these comedians who I'm big fans of and I sometimes consume some of their content because it's a good way to kind of, you know, uh, de disengage from what's going on in society have been, you know, fully on the whole corona conspiracy talk, one of them being the fire and the kid. And Brendan Shaw and Brian Callan are the main proponents of putting out misinformation about stats, misinformation about what's happening and essentially decrying their state of Los Angeles or their state of California Um for locking down and for being a bit hesitant about reopening stuff. And now, due to the spikes that are happening, they are being vindicated, really, in that regard, right? The mayors and the, go and the government and the whatever they may be, whatever you call them, right? Governors, right? They're being vindicated somewhat because the spike has been extreme and expeditious, right, in this, uh, in this ferocity. And guess what? Guess who has corona now? You know, they were talking all that smack, giving it all the big and uh, saying it wasn't that big of a deal and all that sort of nonsense. Guess who's got it, man? Yeah, our boy Brendan Schaub has got 
coronavirus. He's got COVID-19. What a shame. But again, it's post-corona. It's corona karma. That's what it is. Corona karma. These mofos who are just going out there. Again, say what you want about the virus, right? But if you want to go back outside, just put on a mask, stay indoors, avoid big crowds so that we can get back to normal. That's what you got to do, really. It's not that hard of a job. And, it's, and again, I'm not the big believer in this whole, like, oh, use your platform responsibly. But come on. You got to use your platform a bit responsibly, especially if you want to sell people tickets to go to a comedy show. Because <clears throat> if I was them, if I was a comedian and if I was a touring act, I'd be more worried that my fans wouldn't go back out again because they'd be worried about going out in general. So I want to, you know, um, put their mind at ease somewhat. Again, you shouldn't be listening to a comedian when it comes to, you know, uh, an airborne virus, right? They have no expertise whatsoever. Listen to the experts. Um, but if you do want to somehow convince your fans to come out, wouldn't you try and get them to wear a mask? Wouldn't you? Maybe? I don't know. But yeah, Brendan Schaub announced just the other day on Twitter that he's got COVID. And I think the entirety of social media is like, we're not surprised, my friend. We are definitely not surprised. Somebody as reckless and haphazard as you got corona, you don't say. You don't say. Um, here's a screenshot. Here's the day. Well, I got corona. After day three, I'm almost back to 100%. Tune in today's TFAT K. Now, the statement in itself is arrogant, to say the least, right? It's only two lines. It's already annoying me. It's really impressive just how um, uh, unlikable the character Brendan Schub has become over the last few years. It's odd, isn't it? When they first started T-Fat K, I was rooting for him. I think everyone was rooting for him. Maybe as a consequence of what happened with him and Joe Rogan and the fact that he got publicly embarrassed um, regarding his career. But essentially, that whole situation was incredible, right? Joe Rogan calls him out and says he shouldn't be fighting because he doesn't think he's good enough and he's putting himself in danger, all that sort of stuff. And Ben Shaw then pivots into stand-up and doing podcasts in full time and just becomes an entire, you know, media company, right? A brand, a real sort of like mogul in his own little right. And you're like, wow, amazing. Go for you. Go Oh, guy because usually you know it doesn't really end well for fighters people that end up fighting in a cage you know you, you don't necessarily go to fight in a cage when you've got you know some good options lined up for you unless you actually love fighting so for somebody to come out from the other side and do what brian brennan has done sorry is amazing right it's super amazing so you're only gonna root for this guy flipping so kind of a it's um it's a fairy tale, right? But then somehow, throughout that period of time, I'm not sure if it's because of his sucking up to Joe Rogan or it's because of his, um, you know, really snarky remarks against Brian Callen. I don't know what happened, but somehow the narrative around him and the sentiment around Brian, Brendan Schaubert specifically has really changed. He's sort of really put off a lot of people. Even some people that just were fairly in the middle and nonplussed about it have been going in on him, right? And he gets, and he seems to get a lot more, he seems to get some dis... I think the levels of hate Brendan Schaub gets, for instance, is sometimes a bit OTT. But looking at it now, based on what he's been saying about COVID and stuff and his, you know, just plain delusion and, and unacceptance of what's actually happened, I can kind of get why people are going about it. And this statement is a good example of it, right? Well, I got corona, like it's a joke. Cool. Maybe it might be a joke or whatever, whatever it may be. And then after day three, I'm almost back to 100%. So he's already trying to, um, what do you call it, pivot away from the co the collective narrative, what COVID does to you, and saying he's now saying it's not a big deal. And he's, he's, he's already okay after only a couple of days of self-isolation, which is just insane, isn't it? It's a real asinine thing to say because you would assume he would know by now even if he's, you know, again, you're, you're young and you're fine. I think some people are unfortunate. Like, that. who's that Broadway actor who I think I read just recently now? He's going to require maybe a double lung transplant. The same guy who got had to get his leg amputated now is going to require a double liver transplant or something like that. Oh, I forgot what it was. Um, so the, those unfortunate stories do exist where somebody young gets COVID and essentially goes through a torrid time with it. But most of the times, if you're under the age of 60, you should be okay. If you don't have no underlying health issues, you should be fine. But he should know by now, it's less about you getting it. And it's more so about you being asymptomatic and then spreading it to other people. That's a problem. That's why they tell everybody to stay indoors, right? So you don't spread it to people. And you don't over, um, you, don't, you, don't, uh, you don't cause the you know health system in your country to crumble based on the amount of new patients they have coming in. But I don't know, somehow he can't get, get that through his massive head. And then we see another video of him talking about it, right? And it makes me think as well, or makes me kind of wonder, I wonder what their monthly bills are like. Because I think some people, someone's, someone's mentioned previously, right, that comedians aren't necessarily the best with their money, um, which makes sense, right? Because like, you can imagine, you go, I, I'd imagine being a stand-up comedy comedian would be similar to the stuff I'm doing with DJing, right? Being an aspiring DJ. You start off DJing in like rubbish, crappy pubs and bars somewhere for nothing more than a hundred pounds, right? To play like four hour set or something, right? And then suddenly you go from that 
to playing a festival, which is like, you know, maybe let's say 500. And you go from that to being a regular club act somewhere, uh, being a resident and maybe a touring DJ in various clubs, which pays anywhere between a thousand to <clears throat> let's say 10,000 or 15,000 set or 30,000 set, depending on how high up you are. So the steps are really big. You leap 100, 300, 1,000. So when you get to that kind of level, it's only, it makes common sense, especially when you're invoicing people and your payments are coming late and they're all coming in big chunks. It makes sense that you'd, you know, go a bit crazy with the money and get a bit loose because you're always thinking in the back of your head, oh, all I got to do is a couple, I only got a couple gigs left to, no, if I want to pay for that car, I, I go on tour a couple of weekends and I can pay for it outright. So your perception of money gets a bit skewed. But as well, it might be also a consequence of an American, it might be an American thing as well. They tend to like rent things or lease stuff a lot more. It's things like in the States. I'm not sure if, if Brendan Shop does it, but there seems to be a lot of uh, of that going on. And maybe as well, there seems to be maybe a lot of kind of just, you know, spending above your means. I think it's a global thing. I don't think it's kind of uh, only kind of reserved for the Americans. But I, I think about that often when I hear them speak, um, would be them, when I hear them be so defensive or be so aggressive when it comes to a lockdown. Like they must have a lot of outgoing bills, monthly bills. I think so, regardless. Like, it's like, Jesus Christ, imagine. So this is the video where they sort of, you know, they sound a little bit crazy. Let me see if I can get up here. There you go. Come on, play, man. Let everybody know. What, go for speak now. What's up, Brandon? Brandon, hi. What's up, Corona, buddy? This is the announcement of it, right? What's up, Corona, buddy? Laughing, smiling. Now, this is also under the assumption that he's aware that, you know, again, you, you get Corona, you're probably fine. But if you get it and you go to do a comedy show somewhere and you're on a plane and you're in transport and you're meeting your fans after the show, you're probably spreading it to other people who are going to spread it to people who are more at risk than you. So you can only imagine the amount of people he came in contact with on that weekend when they went to San Antonio, wherever it may have been. Like, this is pretty reckless and uh, pretty deplorable, really, isn't it? But again, it's it's current. It's the modern day version of Brendan Shawburn. You have to either be on this train or whatever, isn't it? Ugh, what can you do? Let's play it. Not much, buddy boy. I'm just hanging out pretty much fine. I'm pretty much 100%. Uh, it's a little uh, lakey. Hey, a little lakey. Chin, are, uh, are we recording? We're rolling, yeah. We're good. We should let everybody know that Brendan and I did everything wrong in Texas. We basically, we spent practice, no social distancing, got up in front of 350 people as they were laughing at us and shouting at us. And then we got off stage, didn't change mics, shared it with Malik and Stevie. Stevie's sick as a fucking dog. He's, he's the Corona poster boy. Lost his sense of taste, smell. And then we would walk through a crowd of people going, yay, fist pumping like real irresponsible assholes. Now it looks like Brendan's got coronavirus, and I'm still waiting for my tests. I, well, it, it, well, here's the thing to all that. Okay, well, I'm glad you won that rant, Callan. And here's the thing, though. Like I said, you know, corona is something, you know, I never said it was not real or anything like that. I went about living my life. I got it. And you know what? I'm fine. But that's not the issue, isn't it? The issue isn't living your life and getting it. You're, let's say, let's 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 let's, be, let's imagine for a moment coronavirus is like the flu, right? Which it isn't, but let's say, let's say it is. The issue isn't the, you. Is it isn't about you getting it and getting better from it. It's about you getting it and living your life and spreading it to others who are more at risk. And being a stand-up comic, you're essentially in a business where you have to perform in front of a crowd, right? In front of an audience, in front of a group of strangers you know, from varying varying age groups, right? Or maybe he could say, he could argue that most of his fans are under 45 years old and are mostly men. Regardless, right? You're still performing to strangers who are probably going to pass on to more people who are more at risk than you are. It's just irresponsible. It, it, may, it is. It's just irresponsible. And, and who would want to be the first... This is the thing about them too. They're so brain dead that they want to be the first comics to go out on road, then be the first comics to get COVID, and then be the first comics to spread it to an, you know... Uh, an extraordinary amount of people. I can only imagine the amount of people that he spread this to. It's just insane. And they're smiling, they're laughing about it. It's like, God damn it, these guys are irresponsible. They're like, ridiculous. And again, this is the thing that makes it more annoying. It's like, if you want stuff to get back to normal, wouldn't you just be, wouldn't you just try and be responsible just so you can speed it up a bit? 
you know, tell your fans to wear masks, tell your fans to stay indoors if they feel sick, talk about the numbers being, you know, a bit bad, uh, being okay, but it's no time to kind of let your foot off the gas. I don't know. Just trying to be a little bit positive about it so that people can be confident to go back out to your shows again. But it said no, they do this. Well, I'm we, should also, we should also make a caveat <laughs> that most people, a lot of people who get it who are older are not fine. They're in the hospital. Well, hold, on, hey, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, dude. This isn't a, I'm not going to do this weird corona thing with you. What most people, just like my doctor told me, he goes, what you're, what you're experiencing, 97% of all people who get corona experience the same thing. So He's so annoying, isn't he, man? Like, I'd love to be, I'd love to be that. I, don't, I really admire that with some people, man. The ability to be that um, forthright and completely dumb is really admire. It's really admirable. Honestly, it really is. Like to be so dumb, but you're really confident in what you say. Like, no, no, no. Let's not have this conversation. I'm not going to get into it because I know more. It's like, no, you don't. You don't know anything. You had corona. You had the symptoms. He even he says in later in the later video. He says he felt the symptoms before he flew out. Still went to do his show. Communic you know, did a stand up show where you're on stage shouting into a microphone that they obviously, as Brian kind of said, they all shared. Did no social distancing, high fived all his fans, took some pictures afterwards, which you can see online. But it's okay because he's fine. How about your fans? Not all your fans have flipping access to IVs and personal doctors that they can call, you know, any time of the any time of the day. It's just madness. It, it really, it really is madness. It's like you have to laugh. Like God damn these guys, man. It's like God damn it. Uh, we've got another one. Him explaining how he felt bad, but he still went regardless. You know what the, you know what the worst Sunday when I was flying, I started to feel just like almost. I always get sick on planes, but I didn't feel great. I'm like, man, what's going on? And then. I was like, it was probably just like a cold thing. And then Monday, again, didn't feel great. That's when you guys saw me get the IV and get... And this kind of all... This IV thing as well is incredibly annoying, isn't it? Imagine thinking that that is going to... Oh, I don't know, but let's not even get into that. But yeah, he's got COVID, isn't it? Brendan's got COVID. What karma is that? Karma is really real. Karma is real, isn't it? Post-corona karma is real. It does exist. All the naysayers, all the doubters um, exposed... Because again, I think it's okay to doubt the you know severity of the of the issue and also tell people because i think you know what's i haven't thought about it america's really a wasted opportunity with all their individual states right they could have done some really interesting things with the approach to covid right they could have looked at the statistics looked at their population numbers looked at the breakdown in terms of age demographic and all that sort of stuff and some health underlying health issues and did some really interesting approaches like maybe a certain state that has uh, a more you know, most of their populace is made up of people over the age of 45. You do a lock-in place with people under, from a certain age group. Maybe you do something interesting with the care homes. Um, you could really do some, you know, some some interesting things, Some run some different experiments. Maybe so do herd immunity one place, full lockdown other place, partial lockdown other place. Like, really change it around. But they didn't. They all just kind of turned a blind eye, didn't really do a lockdown seriously, let things get out of control, and then now they have a spike, which probably isn't a spike, probably would have, would, what was meant to happen regardless, but maybe a bit delayed. And now everyone's suddenly always, everyone's scrambling now and trying to put on a mask. It's like, God damn it, man. Especially in a country where you don't have any, no, there's no free healthcare. You just have to, I don't know, I don't know. I don't know with these people, man. I don't know. And of course, um, Pre was it not previous comments? Let's let's look at this one. Uh, this video is jokes. Yeah, this one's really really funny, right? Uh, this is a video that someone put together, um, kind of a timeline of their asinine comments when it comes to uh, COVID nineteen. And again, it's just it's just uh, you you shouldn't be listening to any comedian when it comes to this stuff. But bloody hell, I'm a numbers guy. Again, I'm a numbers. So it starts off twenty six of the six. There's one hundred twenty four one 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 hundred one hundred twenty four. Hundred thousand, a quarter of a million deaths, a quarter of a million on a twenty-six. That is insane. Let's play it. A couple weeks later, play that. A couple weeks earlier, sorry. Cheers to the Corona times that are now, ending soon. Now, Again, I'm a numbers guy. You like have that a lot of old people, yeah, a lot of people at risk. Yeah, like you would flu. have over on hospitals. Yeah, like the flu. Flu to kills that. more, but yeah, sure. You know, when, when, this, cur this Corona lockdown has me feeling all gay. Uh, <laughs> there's this theory, right? There's a million theories. Mm -hmm. So these.
No, there isn't a million theories, sir. Like this is the th- like. Imagine maybe it's an American thing, isn't it? Again, it might be an American thing, or maybe just a consequence of conspiracy theories. It's the kind of unintended consequences of conspiracy theories and flat Earth that people question everything, like way too many things. So, and because you know you have a social media account, you feel as if you can put out your theories with no real education or understanding of the fundamentals of the theory that you are kind of opposing. Maybe I don't know. But again, imagine being this confident, this loud and dumb about a subject that you have. Because we had no, no one was a virologist maybe six months ago. No one had any idea what even COVID meant. No one had any idea what SARS was. No one had any idea how virus spread, how airborne they may be, right? Susceptibility of it. No one knew anything of six months ago. Now all of a sudden everyone's a, I don't know, an armchair virologist. It's just insane. These, these whole peaking things that notice nothing's peaking right now. Notice nothing's peaking right now. And they keep going, okay, not this next. We can keep moving the goal line. Most people do not have this virus. No, the odds are, yeah, most people don't. But even and if you have it, it's... The people that get... Te- oh, but even if you have it, it's... The people- and I give you the stats that I gave you this morning. The 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 percentage, how 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 deadly it really isn't. Yeah. And and then I tell you, most of and the, the contagion level, by the way. Correct. That's what I'm saying. It's it's Look just at the fucking it's, numbers. It's irresponsible. It really is. It's ir- no, but it's irresponsible for you. You're the stand-up comic, and you're going around doing comedy shows whilst the world is slowly but surely suffocating from this invisible virus. It's so selfish, isn't it? Like it really is. I'm okay, so it, it doesn't matter. It's like, but you're gonna spread it to others. You absolute donut. It's bizarre. It's bizarre to say the least. And imagine breaking coronavirus lockdown to go and see Brendan Schaub and Brian Callan perform a stand-up show. Imagine. Not Dave Chappelle, not someone once in a lifetime, not to go see, you know, Jimi Hendrix reincarnated, to go and see those two guys. That's the first thing you want to go to. Really? And you're putting, you're putting fear into everybody. Yeah, and involved. I know there are people listening right now who are like, you have no idea. No, I do have an idea. You yeah, have I no do. idea. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I, I know so. stats and it's pretty black and yeah. white. Is it this. that much of a risk? No, that's is what I'm saying. Look at the numbers. Yeah. And these numbers, this, this isn't something me and Brian made up. No. These are these are the same numbers that any news outlet you're watching, they're spinning super negative. They're using these numbers. Yeah. And without, What's the ch- what, what risk health. are you taking? Yeah. What's the super negative thing though? The super negative thing is telling people that the numbers, that this is probably, again, don't get me wrong. There might be some fear mongering when it comes to reporting COVID. You, you can see it sometimes. You, know, you have to kind of put your phone down and not get too wrapped up in what's going on around the world. But, they're reporting it as it is, isn't it? People are not dying. People are getting the virus and succumbing to some really weird illnesses. Um, the effects are, you know, very far ranging. Like I said, that that Broadway actor went from being a completely, you know, healthy looking dude who performs on Broadway, which, you know, is no easy feat in itself, to then suddenly going, you know, suddenly going into what? A medically induced coma. He had to have his leg amputated and now they're talking about him having a transplant or some shit. It's like, come on, man. That's not normal, do you know what I mean? And then some people get it and don't even notice they have it, right? Like Idris Elba's a good example of it, right? He had it, his wife got it and no no symptoms, uh, no nothing, no ill effects. They kind of just shook it off and kept it moving. Tom Hanks as well is a good example. An older dude, he got that, didn't, nothing else, nothing really bad happened to him. But to suggest that it's not that big of a deal, especially if you're then going to go and perform in front of strangers is really nutty. And then to somehow blame it on the media is like, okay, cool. Some media companies, are fe- some media networks are fear mongering and are using it as a way to kind of drive um, viewership to their platform. Fair enough. But let's just pluck out the actual message and apply it to us, to our day-to-day lives and just kind of be safe. That's it. That's all you can hope for. Especially if your career is mostly centered around pulling strangers on stage. You want it to go away quicker. You want people to be reassured and to be confident to come back out, wouldn't you? Yeah. Again, I'm a numbers guy. Again, I'm a number. And have you noticed the people that say numbers are always the donuts? Brendan Shaw, DJ Academics. I'm a numbers guy. I'm a stats guy. Really? Suddenly you're a numbers guy. Numbers guy. And I'd like to congratulate you on... This is the best one. Will Sasso your, roasted Your change... <laughs> Before the change, to news media. Let's move on to that news. So what do you guys have to fucking tell me about the coronavirus as if you know what the fuck? No, no, hold on. Here, here's the thing, Well, Here's the thing, though. If we get it, we're fine. You give him I got some fucking news for you. You go to news and I'm going to give him fucking Will, you news. You know Texas is going to open up next week? Yeah. Open up yeah, everything Texas, except for schools? I got another one for you. How about Ohio's opening up too? What do you got to say about Ohio? Yeah, really? Will. I got an interesting stat for you, Will. They projected 2 million. It's going to be under 60,000. 
It's me under 60,000. Yeah, because under 60,000 is inconsequential, isn't it? As long as it's under 60,000, I can go perform my shows again. It's perfectly fine. What an absolute muppet. 60,000. The more you ignore the lockdown and tell your audience that there's no fucking problem by by way of, you know, just kind of do, 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 going here never, and there and never, everywhere. And but we've never said that, Will. We've I'm never not said that. saying. Yes. The longer you do that, the longer you do that, sure. the longer we're going to have to push back the eventual return. Not, where, where do you get your news, Will? I'm going to give you. What's that? Where do you get your where news you from? Where are you on Russia? CNN? From you Russia? Where do you get my news from? Yeah, bro. Something called, a little something called the center for disease control. And I encourage all of your fucking audience to check that out for themselves instead of just hearing Brendan and Brian saying, they're opening up Ohio. <laughs> exactly. It was the best response ever to it. Let me skip a bit forward. Down, Will. We're actually kicking we out. Mm. Governor opened up the state. The media assured us everyone would die what have the results shown dot 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 the exact oh, dates and they're going way down but everybody's down when brian remember when brian's like he saw a guy on the street and he's like uh oh yeah it looks like a little bitch i'm like yeah. dude you got it all wrong he's wearing it so he doesn't that's spread true. it to other people that's true i have a problem. look look at his face doubting the efficiency of masks so you don't believe it's it's that serious of an issue you don't believe masks are going to help you think people are overblowing it and you want people to get back out there it's just so many contradiction things isn't it if you want things to go back to normal wouldn't you wear a mask if you want no? And if people are dying, does it mean it's spreading somehow? Huh? Maybe. I have a problem with it. Maybe. I, I mean, that's attitude. why I was doing it. I have a bad yeah. attitude about masks. Hashtag maskless. Yeah. Uh, maskless, over, yeah. You know. Whatever. Free cases continuing right. to spike in the south <laughs> and west, including Phoenix, Arizona. Hospitals there well, now seeing great. a so record great. number of patients. Starting with alarming headlines about the coronavirus, those worries sending the stock market plunging on Thursday. And as states are reopening, many cities and counties across the country are warning of a surge in cases. This map from happens? FEMA you showing the latest hotspots. Well, you know, Here in Phoenix, the intensive care units behind me at Banner Medical Center are very busy as and doctors again, and nurses... I'll open the whole thing, but I'll link it down below for you guys to check it out. But again, I, t I take no glee in this. I take no pleasure in it. It's just unfortunate for my American compatriots out there. You guys are going to be under the spell of corona for a while. It seems like you're way, way behind everyone else around the world. But hey, at least you got to see Brendan Shaw and Brian Callum perform stand-up. <laughs> Anyway, this is the Axios Ding Show, episode number 336. Thanks so much for tuning in as per usual. Um, thanks for, yeah, thanks for tuning in. It's been a pleasure to have you with me. Hopefully you have a good weekend and you enjoy yourselves. And if you're in the UK and you go back to a pub, be safe. Uh, look after yourself. Look after your friends and your family. If you're going to go to a pub, don't stay indoors. Don't be a psychopath and sit on a chair somewhere and consume that pub air conditioning get your beer tip your bartender tip the person well they're serving you the drink take your drink outside to your friends or to the strangers that you've accosted to try and be your friends and stand outside regardless of what's going on indoors stand outside as long as you can if you need to stay inside for a little bit do that but try and stay indoors make sure you use all the hand sanitizer that you can find spread it across your face spread it across your butt cheeks whatever you want to do do that be safe out there and enjoy it enjoy it so that and i want to just yeah just enjoy it so we don't have to go back to flip in lockdown again right just be responsible that's all you have to do be responsible enjoy if you don't have a little bit of an after hours go to a park somewhere get a bit naughty behind the bush do your thing but don't take any necessary risk so that we can crush this thing and get back to some semblance of normality like the rest of the bird kind because i missed it so much but anyway thanks so much for tuning in if you want more information regarding myself make sure you click the link down below actionzinger.com you can find all my socials on there add me on instagram actionzinger all one word add me on twitter actionzinger all one word of course if you're watching for your youtube smash that like hit subscribe leave me a comment down below and if you're listening 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 not wishing if you're listening via the podcast app, make sure you leave me a five star review and share it with all your friends until then my good friends until Till then, Michael Patrick's. See you very, very soon. Take care. Be safe. Bye.